so next we'll have Miklos Raxi from Princeton talking about graph matching and the community recovery, two topics that are dearest to my heart. So let's welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jiaming and, and Lauren and Pauling and to all the organizers. Um, uh, okay, so first of all, it's very nice to be, to be giving a talk in person. Um, Right. And uh, yeah, so today I'll be talking about joint work with my uh, PhD student, Anish Shridhar. And so I'll be talking about correlated stochastic block models, and in particular, graph matching and community recovery. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of terms in the title, uh, many or most of which uh, will be familiar to many of you, but still I'd like to spend the initial part of the talk just um, explaining all these terms and, and how they all fit together, um, just so that we're on the same page. Okay, so let's start with, uh, and please stop me at any time if you have any questions. So let's start with uh, recovering communities in networks. So this is a very well studied problem. Uh, you know, a classical example is Zachary's Karate Club, where there's uh, Zachary studied uh, connections uh, between members of a Karate Club. And then uh, during his study, there was a split in the community um, because of the fights between the instructor and uh, the, the instructor and an administrator. And uh, Zachary, just based on the underlying network structure, he could predict the split almost exactly between uh, the, the product club. But now we have, you know, this problem occurs in at a much larger scale in many areas, many domains of science. Uh, so these include social networks, where we're interested in finding tight-knit communities among people, um, and also uh, biological networks such as protein protein interaction networks where um, we want to find uh, so communities of proteins which correspond to uh, functional logic. Okay, so in order to understand uh, various algorithms and how they perform, a natural thing to do is to study probabilistic generative models. And the canonical model for studying um, uh, community recovery or community detection is the stochastic block model. So this was first introduced by Holland, Lasky, and Leinhardt in 1983. And so here, um, every node has is uh, given a random community label. And then any pair, pair, any pair of nodes is connected uh, independently with some probability that only depends on the underlying community labels. And uh, so this has been very well studied um, over the past several decades, and in, in particular in the past decade, um, driven by um, predictions from coming from statistical physics and then studied in, in many, many communities. So the basic questions here are, suppose we're given such a graph, but without any community labels, can we recover the communities? And in what sense, can we recover them exactly? Can we uh, cover them maybe almost exactly or partially, or, or just can we do anything better than just uh, random guessing? And of course, when we talk about uh, such a thing, we are always talking about just recovering the underlying partition because we don't, we won't be able to uh, recover uh, the specific partition. In this talk, I will focus on the, perhaps the simple setting, just two balanced communities. So we're going to have n nodes. Uh, each node will have a plus or minus uh, label, IID uniformly at random. And uh, so given the community labels, if two nodes are in the same community, they're connected with probability P. If they're in different communities, they're connected with probability Q. So this is the stochastic block model with parameters N, P, and Q. Okay, so far so good. So now what I want to talk about is, well, the fact that uh, in many settings, we don't just have a single network, but we have many correlated networks that contain information that we might be interested in. For instance, if you're interested in social networks, well, you could study Facebook or you could study uh, LinkedIn, but these, of course, both are about people and various connections between people. Uh, and these, but these networks will be correlated, but they're also uh, different. Uh, Facebook is more about personal connections, uh, LinkedIn is more about professional connections. So if you could combine uh, and so synthesize the information coming from the two networks, uh, that could really help you 
in order to uh, better recover the communities. So this is just an example from uh, say social, social networks, but you know such uh, questions uh, make sense in many other areas. So for instance, if you're talking about uh, protein protein interaction networks, if you can um, use if you have the protein protein inter interaction network of several related species, uh, then that can help you in, in various comparative studies and various comparative studies can allow you to um, better understand uh, these underlying data. Yeah. Okay. So just as a historical remark, so this perspective was, was already uh, present in the pioneering work of um, Holland, Lasky and Leinart when they introduced the stochastic block model. So in their notion, the stochastic block model is not just um, a single graph, but it's really a multigraph. So it's really M uh, networks uh, that could be uh, correlated. It's a really, in, the, in their setting on each edge, you don't just have an edge, but really uh, a binary vector. But we'll see um, various differences with, with um, their framework as well. Okay. So next, what I wanna do is introduce a very natural um, probabilistic generative model to capture multiple correlated networks. And this will be what I'll call the correlated stochastic block model. Okay, so the starting point is just a stochastic block model. And um, again, two balanced communities. And you can think of this as the parent graph. So you can think of this as really all uh, social connections, whether they are personal or professional or anything else. And then uh, what you can do is, well, you can subsample this parent graph G to get, uh, so what, but what I mean by this is every edge is included with some probability S, think of S as say uh, a half, and non-edges remain non-edges. So you simple, simply subsample this parent graph to get G1. Okay. Then you independently subsample this graph to get uh, another uh, subgraph, which I'll call G2 prime. And then the next step is to, we're going to, so up until now, uh, so the node labels are inherited and so are the community labels. But now I'm going to uniformly permute uh, the label, the node labels for the second graph. And this is how I get G2. Uh, so there are various ways you can interpret this. Uh, one thing, one way is to just uh, think of this as you're giving, the, given the two unlabeled graphs, so you have no information about the node labels. Um, if you're thinking about social networks, you may think about um, them as being anonymized. Um, and that's a reason why you might not know the node labels. Okay. So there's going to be a uniform random permutation of the nodes. Node labels, we'll call this pi star. And uh, this pair, G1 and G2, I'll call the correlated uh, stochastic block model with parameters n, p, q, and s. And um, to the best of my knowledge, this was first studied by Onaran Garg and Erkip in 2016. Any questions about the model? Okay. So in this construction, marginally, both of the two marginal graphs, G1 and G2, are stochastic block models. Just simply the ed edge connection probabilities are multiplied, p and q are multiplied by the subsampling probability s. Uh, but these corresponding edges are correlated. They're not independent in the two graphs. And just going back to the original work of Holland, Lasky, and Leinhardt. So if you look at G1 and G2 prime, so before the node label permutation, so G1, the pair G1 and G2 prime is a stochastic block model in their formulation. Uh, and more specifically, they call this a pair dependent stochastic block model. Okay, so main question I want to ask is, suppose we're given two correlated networks, two correlated stochastic block models, G1 and G2, when can we recover the communities? And in this work, I'll be focusing on exact recovery. So up to just a flipping of the two of the labels. And in particular, can we do so? Can we exactly recover the communities in regimes where it is impossible to do so using just G1, just uh, one of the marginal graphs. Okay, 
So in order to understand this question, first let's just uh, revisit the all the known uh, results about exact recovery of communities in in a single stochastic lock model. So first of all, in order to be able to exactly recover communities, you cannot have isolated nodes. So the relevant relevant regime to consider is the log the is when the average degree is logarithmic. So from here on out, uh, p which is the edge connection probability within a community will be a times log n over n and q will be b times log n over n. Okay, so Abe Bandera et al. and uh, Mosel Niemann and Fly show that um, essentially this is the threshold for exact recovery. Um, if square root a minus square root b in absolute value is uh, greater than square root of two, then exact recovery is possible. In fact, in polynomial time. And if square root of a, a minus square root of b is less than uh, square root of two in absolute value, then exact recovery is impossible. So let's not worry about the equality case here. And uh, subsequently, Abbe and Sandin figured out the threshold for general stochastic block models. Um, and in the interest of time, let me just skip um, the intuition behind that. For the rest of the talk, what's uh, what it's simply this uh, threshold will be what is important. So, okay, so if we look at G1, what can we do just, we just have G1. Well, then exact community recovery is possible if and only if this quantity is greater than square root of two over S, the subsampling probability here. Okay. So now, what can you do if you had if you have both of the graphs? Well, suppose you also knew the underlying latent permutation uh, for this for the node labels in the second graph. Well, then what you can do is you can overlay the two graphs. Uh, then you have to take the union with the with the correct matching. So then you get um, a graph like this. Here you have edges like the green edges, which are in both G1 and G2. They survived both subsampling procedures. Then you have edges like the yellow ones or orange ones, which survived in G1, but not in G2. And also the purple ones, which survived in G2, but not in G1. Altogether, you still have a stochastic block model just with uh, somewhat different parameters, somewhat better parameters than in the marginal graphs. Okay. But it's not quite the same parameters as in the parent graphs, is in the parent graph because you can have uh, an edge. An edge can be deleted in uh, both of the subsampling sub sub procedures. Okay. So in this case, again, we can just uh, use the, the known results as a black box. An exact recovery is possible if and only if uh, square root of A minus square root of B is greater than, well, this quantity here. And okay. So in particular, there's this region in between where if we would know the underlying latent permutation, then exact community recovery is possible from the two graphs combined, but it's not possible from just the marginal graph G1. Okay. So this motivates the question, well, can we figure out uh, what this underlying latent permutation is? So here's the next uh, main question, which is if we're given these two graphs, G1 and G2, which are correlated stochastic block models, can, when can we uh, recover the latent permutation pi star? And in particular, we're, we're interested in recovering this exactly. Okay, so I motiv motivated this question, uh, which is known as graph matching through this community recovery uh, question, but really this is of significant independent interest and it has been very well studied over the past decade. Uh, so if you consider th this model where P is equal to Q, then the communities don't have any meaning. And then what you get is simply the correlated Edisch-Rinyi model, uh, which was introduced by Peter, Sonny and Grossfauster uh, a decade ago. And since then, especially in the past five years, there have been many, many works, including by many people in the audience here, uh, studying uh, the, this graph matching problem for the correlated Edisch-Rinyi model. And I think there will be 
several talk later. Okay, so at this point, uh, I've explained everything in, in the title of the talk. So this is the model of correlated stochastic block models. And uh, the main questions I, I want to ask are community recovery and graph matching. And in both cases, I'm looking at exact recovery. Any questions? Okay. So let me discuss results. And again, these are joint work uh, with Anish Sridhar. So our main result is to determine the information theoretic uh, threshold for when exact graph matching is possible. So it goes as follows. So uh, if this condition holds, so S squared times A plus V over two is greater than one, then exact, exact graph matching is possible. Uh, and in particular, you can use the following estimator. So if you just uh, take it, the estimator then maximizes the number of agreeing edges between G1 and G2. Uh, this is a very natural estimator. I'll discuss why in a second. So if you take this estimator, then this will uh, recover with probability tending to. Okay. Um, so if you look at this estimator, this is the maximum a posteriori uh, estimator estimate for uh, in the correlated edge training model. It's not quite the map estimator in the correlated SBM model, just because there are various weights in, in, in the map model. But it turns out that this uh, estimate also works all the way down to the information theory threshold. So in the edge training case, uh, Kulina and Kiavash first studied the exact graph matching uh, problem for the in the correlated edge training model. And so they derived uh, this result in the edge training setting. And recently, Wushu and Yu uh, studied uh, the dense regime for this problem. So what is this condition? Well, if you take what's called the intersection graph, so from if you take the correct matching of the two graphs and keep only the edges that were kept in both of G1 and G2, uh, so the, those were the green edges in the previous graph where they're all also orange and purple edges. Um, so if you look at this graph, this is called the intersection graph. And this condition is exactly the condition that this intersection graph is connected with high probability. Okay. And uh, so I mentioned that Onar and Garg and Erki first um, studied the cor this correlated uh, stochastic block model model. Uh, so they obtained the, a sim the same conclusion under stronger parameter assumptions. And also they assumed that all community labels were known in, in both uh, graphs. And that significantly, uh, it makes the analysis significantly easier. And also assuming that makes the downstream application to community recovery um, Questions about the result? Very stupid question. If uh, this is sparse, so the degree is one over n, there will be you know order n isolated vertices, and how can you find the permutation for those? So we're we're in the logarithmic degree version. So ah okay, yeah, yeah. So so so. Other questions? Okay, uh, so uh, it turns out that this is uh, indeed the information theoretic threshold. So this was shown in previous work by uh, Kulina, Singhal, Kiavash, and Mittal. And um, the, I, the, I, so this is exactly so if this intersection graph is disconnected, then you cannot uh, exactly recover the graph matching. And effectively, what you can do is, well, in this case, if you look at the intersection graph, there will be many isolated vertices. And what you can, so these vertices, 
being isolated in the intersection graph means that they have non-overlapping neighborhoods in the two uh, graphs. And so effectively what you can do is you can just permute them within the two communities and any such permutation will give you uh, something with which has the same kind of a posterior probability. So, and there will be polynomially many isolated vertices. So you won't be able to figure out the right exact permutation. Okay. So now that we know the, the information theoretic limits for exact graph matching, we can look at what this implies for community recovery. So, if so, under these two conditions, uh, there is an estimator that what I wrote here is just that exact community recovery is possible with probability going to one. And what is the proof? Well, under this first condition, we can recover the underlying graph matching with high probability. And uh, then once we have that, we just take the union graph and run any community recovery that works down to the threshold. Okay. And this is precisely the, the threshold for exact community recovery for, for the stochastic block model with those parameters. And the second condition is necessary uh, because so if the second condition fails, uh, then exact community recovery is impossible. This is simply because I could even give you the this underlying uh, latent permutation, uh, and then you could uh, take the union graph and you would still not be able to recover the communities exactly, uh, just by no previous. Okay. So we can also uh, plot these uh, results, uh, these regimes. So the three parameters here, A, B, and S, so let's just say fix the subsampling probability S, and here, this is A and B. So let's say, say this uh, picture here on the left. So here, the green, in the green region, you can just exactly recover the communities from G1, what, the first graph. In the red region, even if you have both graphs, you cannot do anything. You cannot exactly recover the communities. In the cyan region, you can't recover just from G1, but you can recover from the two graphs combined. And in this yellow region, well, you cannot recover exactly from just G1, and we don't know if it's possible or not um, from the two graphs combined. Yeah, uh, and in fact, so I'll mention this at the end, but I think we think that the answer is actually uh, that the truth is in between. So uh, in part of this yellow region, you can do exact community recovery and part of, in part of it, you can't. I guess Any other questions? Yes. Uh, we, yeah, yeah, so that this is, um, this estimator is not, you know, computationally efficient. So that's another uh, very natural open question. And I think there might be some further results about, you know, efficient estimators later uh, this week for at least the, the hydrogen setting. Can I ask yeah. a clarifying question? Yes. So the, at the estimator you analyze quadratic assignment? Or? Yes, yes, yes. So try to analyze something like, Maximum marginal marginal uh, likelihood because that would be I mean just average out the labels because yeah, that one no. doesn't care about whether it's SBM or not right only use some marginal uh, we we didn't try that one okay okay so you can plot this in in different ways depending on which parameter you fix and you see similar kind of plots. Um, okay, so let me let me say a few words about the proof. So about the the graph graph matching. Okay, so this is uh, the estimator that we uh, study, 
And so there's this underlying latent permutation pi or pi star that we want to recover. And this induces a permutation on vertex pairs, which we call the a lifted permutation. And we denote, denote these by tau. Um, and so we really care about these uh, lifted permutations since those are what show up in this uh, estimator, maximizing this uh, alignment score. So the score is really the number of uh, green edges that are found. Okay, so what we want to do is, well, we want to say that, well, the, the true underlying latent permutation, latent permutation will give rise to uh, the, the largest alignment score. So we can just subtract for any uh, tau, which is a lip, lifted permutation. We can look at its alignment score and uh, subtract it from the, the, the ideal alignment score. If all of these quantities are positive, except for, so this quantity is going to be zero for the true uh, latent permutation. Uh, and if it's positive for every other permutation, then our estimator is correct. Okay, so what we want to do is understand this quantity. So, and this can really be any, uh, this permutation pi can be any permutation. So we want to somehow characterize how it differs from the underlying latent permutation pi star. Uh, one way to do this is to understand, you know, how in how many uh, entries does it differ? And here, because there are two communities, it makes sense to consider how many vert vert vertices are mismatched in the two communities. Let's call those k1 and k2. Uh, so just heuristically, uh, if k1 and k2 are large, then it's going to be much more unlikely that uh, such a permutation is going to be the one, the one that has a higher line of course. Uh, but on the other hand, there are many more such permutations. Now, what we care about are not really vertex mismatches, but really edge mismatches, because that's what shows up in the alignment score. Um, so M plus tau will be the number of um, edge mismatches that are within a community. And then minus tau will be the number of uh, edge mismatches between communities. And so it, it's, it's not too hard to go from uh, vertex mismatches to edge mismatches. In fact, there's you know, a, a precise common formula that you can just write down. Uh, but let's just assume, so in the following, we'll just assume that these communities are indeed approximately balanced, which they are with high probability. And so, Suppose that K1 and K2 are small, think of them as constant for now. Then indeed, uh, if you have a node, well then, if it's mismatched, then there will be roughly N over two other nodes, uh, every, everybody here roughly, who uh, it will be in a mismatched vertex pair. So the number of edge mismatches will be something like this, uh, n over two times k1 plus k2. And this, the same will hold even uh, across communities. So this only holds if k1 and k2 are relatively small. In general, you only have this bound with uh, an extra factor of a half. Okay, so ultimately what we want to show is that under this condition, there exists some delta such that um, the probability that the estimator has uh, K1 mismatches in the first community and K2 mismatches in the second community is bounded by uh, N to the minus delta times K1 plus K2. If we can show this, then we can just sum over K1 and K2 and indeed the error probability will go to zero. So how do we show this? Well, there's going to be, we're just going to do a union bound over all possible such uh, lifted permutations. And this gives a factor of N to the K1 plus K2. And so then we have to understand this individual probability. 
And it, it effectively boils down to uh, computing bounds on the probability generating function of x tau, this quantity that is the difference uh, in the alignment score. Okay. And um, eventually what we show is that this is bounded by this quantity here. And uh, okay, so you can see here in this expression, this expression, these m plus tau and m minus tau is uh, coming up, which as we saw on the previous slide, so m plus tau and similarly m minus tau is at least something like, uh, so, like this, uh, if k1 and k2 are small, and they're at least this is a factor of a half in general. So if you plug that in here, um, you can see, well, the, n the factor of n cancels out, and you have a k1 plus k2, uh, which appears here as well. So if you forget this and, and you look at this bound here, then you see the S squared times A plus B over two appearing. Um, okay. Now, <clears throat> if you just look at the probability generating function of X tau, then actually you will only get, you won't get down all the way to the threshold. You will only, you will be lose by a factor of two. And so you have to work a bit harder to get down all the way to the threshold. So you have to look at this joint generating function of S X tau with uh, these other quantities, which um, let me not get into right now. But let me just say that, um, okay, so you, you have to obtain this bound on the probability generating function. So how does this work? Well, you want to compare tau to the original latent uh, lifted permutation tau star. And it turns out that if you look at this composition of tau star inverse and tau, well, you can decompose this according to cycles. And due to independence across the edges in the original model, you have independence ac across cycles here. So you only have to do, you, you only have to bound uh, this quantity for a cycle. And um, what was done previously is that in the correlated edge training model, you could explicitly compute this generating function. Now, in the correlated stochastic block model, that just uh, seems uh, not possible because the what this uh, probability generating function uh, looks like, it will really depend on the community labels throughout the cycle, and not just how many of each, each community do you have, but really where, which nodes have which community uh, in, in, the, in the cycle. So instead, what we do is we compute some uh, recursive bounds for the set probability okay. Any questions? Omega and zeta required because otherwise the is dominated by cases where there's a lot of mismatches and one community more than the other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really required to deal with the large K1 and K2 case. It's once here. In general, we only have uh, this bound. And so we want to boost that up. And, and that's what we can do with these variables. OK. <clears throat> Let me turn to some open problems. So what? natural open question is what happens in this yellow region. And um, so, as I meant, so here, exact graph matching is not possible. And, but it still might be the case 
that exact community recovery is possible. And so, as I mentioned, we think that in part of the region, uh, you can do exact community recovery, and in part of it, you can't. Um, so, recall that in this regime, just from a, a single block model, you can do almost exact recovery. So, really, the challenge is to boost the almost exact recovery to exact recovery um, using the other graphs. Um, okay, so let me not write down the formula, but basically um, you have uh, polynomially many nodes that you, uh, that you cannot exactly re recover. Also in, the, in this uh, graph matching, you have uh, some polynomially many uh, nodes that you cannot match. So somehow these have to uh, spice each other and, you know, one has to dominate the other variants of the system. Right, what, what are the, I mean, just in the picture here, like how the blue is. Oh, yeah, well, the blue will be some, it will be some, something like this. Oh my God. And then here it will be red. There isn't like a like the boundary will just look like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. If I do the graph matching and I don't get the exact recovery, is it easy to tell which vertices are matched correctly? Yeah, that's a very good question. And in fact, you know, you'd like to do that in order to. Uh, use this for applications. Uh, and in fact, there's a, a, a paper by Lina Kievash Mital and Spor, where what they do is if you look at the K core of the intersection graph uh, for appropriate K, then it turns out that those vertices will actually be uh, correctly matched. So, so indeed, this is something you would like to do, and, and that, that's a uh, this the K four be helpful. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so, the current algorithm for exact craft matching is uh, well, it's not efficient. So, one important question is: Do there exist? efficient algorithms for graph, match graph matching. Uh, so I believe we'll hear more about this uh, later this week. But regardless of what the answer to this is, even if it's not possible to do exact graph ma matching efficiently, it still might be possible to you know, not use uh, this particular algorithm, but to use some kind of uh, relaxation that is polynomial time to recover the communities exactly. So this is not clear if it's possible to do or not. But I think it's a natural question. Then you can study these kind of questions uh, in general for K communities with general parameters and both the graph matching questions and the questions of uh, community recovery. Also, so today I talked about exact exact community recovery, but you can go beyond that. And uh, for instance, one thing you might want to ask is what happens in the constant average degree regime. So there you can imagine uh, parameter regimes where marginally both graphs are below the keston stigum threshold, but the, their union is above the keston stigum threshold. So in particular, it's impossible to do community detection from just a, a single graph G1, but potentially it might be possible to do community detection uh, by combining the two the information from the two graphs. Um, of course, the challenge is that in these regimes, exact graph matching is impossible. Uh, so you can't use this as a black box. In fact, probably you can only recover uh, the graph matching um, in some kind of partial way. And is that enough uh, to boost Estimates to get okay, so let me just summarize quickly what I talked about. 
So I talked about this model of correlated stochastic block models, and we determined the fundamental limits of uh, exact raft matching. And using this, we saw that uh, exact community recovery is possible in regimes where it is not possible to do so from just uh, one of the graphs alone. And more generally, I think that correlated random graphs um, are really great and pose many exciting challenges, uh, both statistically and computationally. So it's very much in the theme of uh, this workshop and more broadly this semester here at Science. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so we have the time for questions. Uh, this is not a good enough question to deserve the mic, but so the, uh, it was not obvious to me at first why, even if you can do the matching, the best thing to do is just look at the union of the two graphs. Part of me thought, oh, but doesn't it tell you more if an edge occurred in both graphs? And it doesn't in this case, because in both cases, you, you know, it was in the, you know, the previous graph, the one that got subsampled, but you can imagine fancier probabilistic models um, where the sampling prob probability is itself uh, different, whether the endpoints are inside or outside the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that case, maybe you don't wanna just take the union, maybe the, the uh, edges in the intersection graph are a bit more powerful. That's correct, yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Um, yeah, I actually do have a, one quick uh, question about uh, this uh, conjecture. So I'm, yeah. Really, yeah, I'm quite interested. So like, as you mentioned, the difficulty here is really how to boost from almost exactly to exact recovery. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So then I guess, yeah, like, uh, um, I mean, in this, okay, so you probably can only use, so used, so it is enough to use just to uh, get to the almost exact recovery, for example, yes, yes. right? And then the purpose is like how to align G2 to G1 so that you can boost it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So for that, and I, I know you cannot get the exact graph matching, yes. but I just want to hear a little bit more. Like, uh, I mean, in this case, you can also get almost a perfect recovery of the right, matching. Right, right. So you can get almost exact recovery. So in, indeed, uh, there will only be like a pond only many vertices that are not aligned. Uh, and in particular, you, you can achieve this with this uh, K-core alignment that I mentioned. And so then you also know that those are correctly matched, which is really useful to uh, go between the two graphs. Uh, so you can do something like uh, an almost exact uh, community recovery in one of the graphs, then align them almost exactly and knowing which are correct. And that uh, takes it over to the other graph. Yeah, so it seems like it's doable, but um, but but, right. but I'm a little bit surprised you said like there's a regime where you still believe uh, like uh, right. So so, yeah, so so um, it, you still so okay. So indeed, it's doable. So it's something we're working on. Uh, but so. Um, you're going to have you're going to have to use, uh, so you're going to have some, say in, in one of the graphs, you're going to have some uh, nodes that are not correctly, uh, the communities are not correctly recovered. And so you, you take this over to the other graph. And um, so then you, you, you want to do some kind of majority uh, votes uh, to, to boost uh, the labels up to, to, to correctness. Uh, but uh, for that, you, you, it depends on how many of these nodes you have and uh, you know, are the parameters of the block model there uh, enough to boost that up. And so that will cause there being this boundary within the so, so Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts. That's great. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, if no, no question, let's thank the speaker again.
Um, okay, so that will be all for uh, this morning, and then we're going to come back at uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Thanks.